the market for renewable energy is rapidly changing. Can you kind of talk about some of the new growth opportunities that you see in the renewable sector right now? Yeah, I mean, I think, you know, conventional wisdom would say, obviously, solar and wind are not going anywhere, right? They're going to continue to grow exponentially. Batteries are getting, you know, more efficient. They're getting larger. They're getting longer durations, right? We're seeing opportunities continue to arise in pump storage. So, you know, hydro assets. Do you realize how many opportunities there are for engineers in the energy and renewables sector? Well, in today's episode of the Civil Engineering CEO, I have with me Michael Case. Michael is a licensed professional engineer. He's also the power and energy business line executive at WSP for the entire United States. And in this episode, Michael's going to talk about all of the opportunities available in this industry and how exciting it is because guess what? They're available to all engineering professionals. And he talks a little bit about that and how you can get involved. All right, now I'd like to welcome our guest onto the show for today. Michael Case is a licensed professional engineer. He's also the power and energy business line executive at WSP for the USA. Mike, welcome to the Civil Engineering CEO. Anthony, great. No, I appreciate it. Thanks for having me. Excited to have you. I think it's a, what you're doing is really interesting. And so just to, to get us going, Mike, just to kind of let you meet our audience here a little bit, can you tell us a little bit more about yourself and kind of how your career led you to take on this position, this specific position focused on power and energy at WSP? Yeah, no, thanks. Um, so First, I'll have to start with, obviously, I come from a very large family, fantastic, great family. We all get along. So I think I'll start with who I am as a father, first and yeah, foremost. Great. Uh, I've got two beautiful young daughters, Michaela and Brianna, at ages 10 and 6. They just started school yesterday with uh, my wife of 15 years, Kristen. Um, so clearly, right out of the gate, I'm going to let you know, I'm a family man, you know, through and through. We both were actually, my wife and I raised in Northern New York and following college, you know, moved to New York City where I took the opportunity uh, and started my career with PB Power, Parsons Brinkerhoff, at the time as an entry level electrical engineer, uh, right fresh out of college, getting right into the power and energy space. Really following the blackout of 2003 is when I kind of started my career. So you can imagine the amount of opportunities that that provided in the energy space, looking after, you know, healthcare, looking after critical infrastructure and what that meant because of the ripple effect following that event. So kind of a unique time really to kind of enter the market and had a great opportunity with PB Power at the time, which is now, of course, the power and energy business within WSP. So throughout my career with them, ultimately, I've worked my way up through various management and leadership positions. I've had the opportunity to work on some truly amazing and transformational projects, really gaining you know some phenomenal experience throughout that. And I've had the privilege to work with you know really some great leaders, some great mentors throughout that you know career to really get me to the point where I am today, which is you know thrilled to be leading our U.S. business right now for WSP in the U.S. Really at a time with the energy transition that is transformational and really an exciting market to be in right now. Um, I think if there's anybody listening that, you know, wants some career advice, it would be look at energy very specifically because it is truly the nucleus of everything, whether it's transportation, whether it's buildings, you know, energy, you name it, it, it all kind of boils back to energy. So Spent 15 years of my career up in New York City um, in our corporate headquarters, uh, and then ultimately a few years ago moved down to South Florida. Uh, so really moved from the concrete jungle to the real jungle of South Florida, but it's been a great transition for our family uh, and really excited for the opportunities ahead um, with us here at WSP. That's great. Well, I appreciate you. You know, telling us about you being a family man. I have three kids myself. I have a daughter named Brianna as well. So we have that <laughs> in common. But um, I appreciate that. And I also am from New York, Rockland County, New York. And I, But I appreciate upstate New York. I spent time in Albany. I visited Rochester, Buffalo. Anyone that's from New, New, upstate New York that can move to Florida is probably, <laughs> it's a different atmosphere for sure. But um, it's glad to hear that your family's made that transition. And it does sound like you're in a very exciting vertical right now 
being energy. And I want to talk to you a little bit more about that, of course, today. And one of the questions I'd love to hear about, just tell us more about WSP's power and energy division, like size wise. Tell us a little bit about the services, how many people are in that group right now. Tell us what you can about that. Yeah. So uh, I appreciate the question and the opportunity really. So, you know, the way that we're structured now with that business line vertical for power and energy, we've subset that into various sub markets, which really are focused around power delivery, which is our transmission and distribution. Think about, you know, heavy clean energy transmission, as well as substations distribution to support, you know, the sheer infrastructure of moving electrons. Our onshore renewables business, which is focused on wind, solar, and battery storage, mainly at the utility scale, but I'll touch later on relative to you know where we kind of see that shifting as well in distributed generation. Um, we're at the forefront of the offshore wind market in the U.S., obviously still in its infancy, but we've had the opportunity to work on some of the cutting edge you know uh, projects that are being developed as well as in construction in the offshore wind space. We've got a team focused on distributed energy as well as electrification. So if you can imagine just the sheer volume of demand that's being put on the grid around EVs and, you know, looking at electrification of buildings and transit, you know, the, again, the supporting infrastructure. And then finally, kind of a legacy part of our business is in the hydropower sector as well, too. So those are the main subsectors, you know, really around our power to energy business. We have staff located throughout the U.S., um, really with some pockets of center of excellence for our energy business in particular. Uh, that includes up in the Northeast, New York City and Boston. We've got staff down in Atlanta, as well as a large uh, contingent in Houston, Boulder, and up in Portland and Vancouver. So really kind of a, a wide range of energy offices and staff located in those centers. But the unique aspect about a WSP being 69,000 people globally, 14,000 people in the U.S., any given day, probably about 1,000 people plus or minus touching our energy clients and our energy projects around a wide range of services for those clients is really being able to tap into those local offices, tap into those local expertise and really collaborate across this organization to deliver for our energy clients. So specifically around the services that we offer, it, it's full service. So I would start by saying the upfront advisory services. So whether you're looking at project financing or economic modeling associated with energy assets and projects, if you're looking for grants relative to you know the opportunities of funding that are out there right now, as well as community involvement and public stakeholder engagement is what our advisory services offer. And then clearly, you know, as most may have noticed over the last couple of years in our environmental business, we've grown tremendously. So all of the upfront planning, routing, siting, permitting of any type of energy asset, again, whether long haul transmission or siting, you know, for renewables, our environmental team has us covered there. Program management has been a key offering, something that we've leveraged from the other parts of our business, you know, legacy learning from, you know, major transporta transportation infrastructure, long linear projects, um, and being able to translate that over to our energy clients has been a key success for us. So setting up PMOs, project management, project controls, you know, and really kind of taking, you know, that program for that client and being able to deliver it full service has been key. Obviously, the core engineering capabilities, right? So, you know, we're talking about the electrical, mechanical, civil, structural, geotech, and everything from owner's engineer to detailed design capabilities, um, engineer of record, right? And then finally, construction management. Um, so really actually seeing these assets get built and supporting our clients in that function, whether it be through construction management or construction field services. So, you know, it, it's very unique, I think, in a, in a way that, you know, working for a firm like WSP, it truly is a full service offering. And we truly do like to sell the whole store where obviously our clients want it. Yeah. And I'm really glad, Mike, that you took a few minutes to take us through the different offerings in the energy group, because I do think that you're an electrical engineer, I believe, by schooling. Yep. I talked to tons of civil mechanical engineers. It sounds to me from what you've described that any engineer can get into the energy sector because there are so many different things that they can do, which is good to know. Because earlier you said, hey, 
career perspective, think about energy. And I just want to, you know, kind of confirm that with you that there's a lot of different options in in energy. No, oh, it's tremendous. You're right. I mean, environmental scientists, right, and the key role that they play in making certain that you know we're we're looking out for our natural environment, right, relative to these energy assets. Um, you know, you look at offshore wind and what that means to that environment. You look at these long linear projects. So, you know, from that perspective, but, you know, if you want to be a strong project manager, cost controller, schedulers, right, you know, may, these major programs within energy are now billions of dollars, right? They're massive programs that are being developed that really need that level of attention and detail. So regardless of your engineering, regardless of your scientific, your, you know, kind of skill set, energy should definitely be a focus area for, you know, your growth and potential. That's great. So before we dig a little bit more into the energy industry, I want to ask, just ask you a little bit about leadership for a minute. This is obviously a a huge leadership position that you sit in right now. You just described to us kind of what you're overseeing and it took more than a couple of minutes to describe it, which means there's a lot that, that you have to handle here. You're a technical professional by upbringing, by background, by education. When you had that opportunity to make that transition, into management leadership and ultimately into this role, you know, how did you approach that from a mindset perspective or a confidence perspective since you really by training and by background were very technical? How did that, how did that kind of, what was that process like for you when you thought through where you want to go in your career? Yeah, I think, I think I've always been driven. Um, you know, I gave this example recently of in high school, even, you know, very tech oriented, right. And what I wanted to do, but, you know, and fantastic school, don't get me wrong, but you know, the offering that was there didn't really kind of whet my appetite. And I probably have to give my mother credit for this. We lived in Messina, New York, very industrial town. We had General Motors, we had Alcoa, we had New York Power Authority. I actually, probably through her help, I can't really recall the specific details, uh, got a job shadow with the electrical engineer at General Motors when I was probably a junior, senior in high school, right? So I was very motivated to really kind of get out and learn, you know, in that type of setting. And I think that that's important now, you know, I know even at our daughter's school, you know, kind of getting engaged with the community, right? And really having life lessons learned early, right, is key. And I I do credit, I think, even going back that far, really that motivation that I had to strive to take on the next step, right? And I think working at a company like I have for really the last 20 years, those opportunities have, you know, progressed and presented themselves that clearly I was motivated to continue to take those opportunities as they arose. Um, Obviously, some of them just through, you know, sheer, you know, looking at retirements, right. And people kind of stepping aside and me being able to kind of elevate into those positions, but always, you know, deep down motivated. And I think what's key in that though, is early on in my career, laying the foundation of a true technical background though, right. I don't think you can necessarily elevate into, you know, leadership positions, maybe in an engineering field, right. Without having that core competency learned, early in your career. And I think, you know, again, giving credit where credit is due, you know, the leaders that I worked with really gave me those opportunities. They really pushed me to take that job, you know, take that assignment, get that exposure out in the field, you know, get your hands dirty with the contractors to learn where you may have made mistakes, right? And learn from those mistakes and move forward. So laying that foundation, I think is key. And then taking those opportunities relative to the management has always been a drive for me and just something that has been, I think, rooted in me from really an early age to continue to grow and expand into my leadership and management capabilities. That's great. Yeah, because I mean, I think at the end of the day, I know firms like WSP, the size that you are, you have plenty of technical career tracks that one could stay on for their entire career. But it's when you come to that fork in the road and they say, hey, do you want to keep going technical or do you want to jump into management? For you, it sounds like you had a really clear vision that, you know, you you wanted to do more management leadership type of tasks, which is great. And I would just say for those listening, there are some organizations that really don't, like they kind of make it seem like you have to go into management. And I don't that think that that's necessarily a good thing either because there are some people that are going to want to do tech. And we need technical professionals for their entire career, of course. Yep. So, so I think if you're listening whatever organization you're in, and obviously we know that this is available at WSP, but just generally speaking, 
I think you want to have options in your career as a technical professional to either stay on a technical track or go into leadership and management if you have those abilities kind of like Mike did or those desires. And you should look for that in your organization because, you know, that's that's a big, really fundamental career choice for a technical professional, from my opinion, from all the people that I've interviewed over the years. And your mindset on how you approach that fork in the road, if you will, is very important in your career. No, it is. And and like you said, you know, ultimately we have a need in the industry for all of it, right? Management, yeah. leadership, technical expertise, client relationships, right? You name it. And that skill set that you want and that career path that you want to take is going to be vital and important in everything that we do. So I think the short answer of that is there's there's room for everyone, right? And we need everyone that you know to be successful here in each of those paths that you choose and it's just yeah like you said putting into perspective making that choice right and that pivotal kind of moment in your career and that could be early that could be late in your career you know i don't think there's any set time when that moment comes but kind of understanding and having a you know at least a desire as to where you want to take your career is important to yourself relative to that development and that growth so that you're making the right steps along the way Absolutely. And so obviously, Mike, you took the management leadership path. So I'm just curious if we were to kind of question a couple of your team members about your kind of leadership or management style, how do you think they'd describe your style? Yeah, I, I, I'd hope they, they would say that I'm open and transparent, right? I think, you know, at the end of the day, um, you know, while there's structure, right, there's hierarchy, you know, everybody has an org chart in, in some way, shape or form, right? And while I may, you know, be the business line executive for the energy team, I truly do look at it as a team. Going back to that comment at the beginning, I truly look at it as a family and yeah. really, you know, this interconnected web of leaders that I have within me and the privilege to work with some extremely talented people, I truly do you know, seek their advice, right? You know, the the years of experience and the, you know, the information that they bring to the table. I want us to all be in the trenches together with each other, right? And I think from that perspective, they would appreciate and hopefully say, you know, my openness and willingness to, you know, have them be a part of this, you know, leadership team. You know, it's not, you know, a, a dictatorship and it's my way or the highway sort of approach. And just me being transparent with them in, you know, what we're set up, the vision that we have, and really looking for them to help support that throughout the, throughout, you know, their careers and throughout ultimately what we're trying to achieve together. So I think in that respect, it's being in the trenches together, right? And being open and transparent with each other and that type of management and communication style that I have with them. That's great. And it's great to hear you mention that. Even a company as big as WSP, you can still have a family feel in your own teams and in your you know departments because I think that that can be a little bit of a misnomer when someone sees a company that large, right? The immediate thought is I'm going to get lost there. You know, it's kind of like a big machine of just so many people. But you know, obviously, based on what we've heard from you just in the beginning of the the our chat here today, is that it is a family feel. You feel very connected to your team members. You know, and you're, you're doing some special things together. And I think that's what people want in any place that they go and work, regardless of the size. So it's nice to hear that WSP is able to create that even at a large scale company. Yeah, I think it's, I think it kind of goes back to really our culture, right? And what we've set, you know, from the foundation relative to that entrepreneurial spirit, as, as much as the company has grown over the years since I've been here and gotten to the scale that it is, I can honestly say I have always felt like I've worked for a small business. And I know that's a, you know, a, a, a big factor to say when you work for a company that's as large as ours. But I truly do believe that, you know, and that's where you can still set that dynamic right within your team, within the relationships that you build across the business lines, across the company to really have that, you know, uh, that approach and that culture relative to still kind of feeling like a small business. Absolutely. All right. So let's get back to energy here. I got a question for you. So the market for renewable energy is rapidly changing. Can you kind of talk about some of the new growth opportunities that you see in the renewable sector right now? Yeah. I mean, I think, you know, conventional wisdom would say, obviously, solar and wind are not going anywhere, right? They're going to continue to grow exponentially and play really a pivotal role in our energy transition and our goals relative to net zero. 
I think specifically to wind, offshore wind is going to play a key component of that. And, you know, although there may be headwinds in the industry right now, you know, just relative to supply chain, inflation, et cetera, we can't take our foot off the gas pedal, right? Uh, we've seen, you know, just the, the, the ability of offshore wind helping us go to net zero, helping us take off, you know, carbon um, fossil fuel based generation and shifting that to offshore wind. So I think that that's going to be a key pivotal role for us. I mentioned earlier about, you know, the distributed generation scale of solar and battery energy storage. So when you look at the demand that electrification is going to put on localized, the ability to go put distributed, you know, solar and renewable power with, you know, the battery storage capability to kind of ride through those, you know, no sunny days, right? No windy days, ride through those, um, not only from that demand perspective, but also resiliency perspective. So now you can also look at community scale microgrids and the resilient factor that these offer at that distributed generation scale as well, too. Um, you know, batteries are getting, you know, more efficient, they're getting larger, they're getting longer durations, right? So batteries, I think, are going to continue to play a key role. Uh, and obviously, the benefits that they provide to the grid um, as well are going to be key. We're seeing opportunities continue to arise in pump storage. So, you know, hydro assets where we can look at additional pump storage capabilities to add clean generation to the grid uh, continue to, to, to show themselves. And then finally, green hydrogen, right? So I think, you know, you look at the funding that's going into the hydrogen hubs right now, and obviously the ability to create that using green energy and create a fuel source that can also, again, in those days when the sun doesn't shine and the wind doesn't blow, give us the ability to have, you know, that uh, that ride through power capability, leveraging hydrogen in that capacity as well, too. So I think those are some of the growth opportunities that we're currently seeing. Um, and then albeit not necessarily renewable, but a clean form of energy, I'd be remiss not to say that I do truly do believe that SMRs, small modular reactors, are going to play a key factor into our net zero goals as well, too. When you look at the sheer volume of generation that you know we need to create uh, relative to the future demands that we have and moving from, like I said, carbon-based to cleaner fuels, I do believe that SMR is going to be a factor as well. So really you know, as an industry, we've got to pull all of these levers, right? That all of these tools that we have in our tool chest uh, to achieve these aggressive goals that we've got in front of us. What is it for those that aren't that educated on the energy industry? What is an SMR? Can you describe that? It's a small modular reactor. So basically, you know, no longer, you know, the large 800 gigawatt, you know, nuclear facilities, right? But smaller packaged facilities that ultimately are more mobile, they could be deployed, right? And the ability to leverage those in a clean fashion with less fuel as well and and waste. Okay. Just going back to what you said about batteries for a minute, just like, just to give us an example of some of like what you might do. So does that mean like for you with your team, let's say you might help a client who needs to manufacture, develop batteries in some of the, the facilities or what would that look like? So actually all of the above, right? So we, we do quite a bit of work in supporting the manufacturing of batteries, right? We also have a mining business, right? When you look at the raw material, you know, associated with these. So really that full value chain of batteries, you know, from the upfront, you know, relative to the raw minerals to supporting manufacturing facilities. Uh, we mainly do that out of our property and buildings and industrial business that ultimately can help support, you know, the manufacturing of batteries. And then really where we get those deployed, right, is within our power and energy sector in deploying them with solar or wind, you know, being able to ride through those peaks relative to the generation. And then also you see just standalone packaged battery energy storage solutions as well, supporting the grid, right, where there's areas of peak demand and they're able to deploy the generation from the batteries in those periods of peak demand to help support the strain on the grid and the, the, you know, the resiliency factor associated with that as well. 
Okay. Awesome. That's awesome. I mean, listen, I'm, and I'm asking you some of these questions, Mike, because I think a lot of engineers in our industry hear these terms, energy, and but they don't really know what goes into it and what all those opportunities are. So it's great to hear someone like you that's kind of knee deep in it, if you will, kind of take yeah. us through some of that. So the energy transition is obviously creating a high demand for skilled workers. From your perspective, what are some effective strategies to address these workforce shortages and kind of support this transition? Yeah, I mean, I think that, you know, probably the, the misnomer is it all starts with STEM, right? And I think it goes back to, you know, engaging our communities and our schools and our universities. You know, I was thrilled my my daughter chose, you know, wind turbines as her assignment last year for school. And clearly, you know, she had uh, some support at home when it came to that assignment. But I think it really does start with STEM. I think we need to promote what is really a once in a generation transition um, that we see with this energy transition and the exciting career opportunities that that is going to provide to individuals right now in the marketplace. I think I'm of an age also where from an electrical perspective, there was a shift from electrical kind of pure power to computer engineering. So, you know, if you look at most kind of college courses now, they're, they're electrical and computer engineering. And I was of that age where obviously during the boom, the computer engineering field kind of grew much more exponentially than pure power electrical engineering. So for me, specifically relative to the electrical is that need to invest quickly to develop that talent because we do have this mid-career gap in the workforce right now with ultimately baby boomers retiring, right? And their skill sets leaving the workforce, that career gap in that, you know, mid-career gap that we have is the need to really invest quickly and develop, you know, our entry-level engineers into this space, specifically relative to the electrical. And then finally, I think the last thing relative to kind of like the workforce is, you know, I've said this before in previous kind of panels and discussions is just Ultimately, when you look at the workforce shortage, whether it be the utilities, whether it be the engineering consultants, whether it be contractors building these energy infrastructure projects, I think we just need to all realize we're vying for the same talent. And ultimately, at the end of the day, we all want to achieve these aggressive goals that are out in front of us. So just coming together to work together as a as a industry and as a market to really kind of look at what's best you know, for our clients for the development of these projects and really come together in that fashion um, across, you know, kind of these, you know, buying industries, buying companies for the same talent as well. Hmm. Interesting. That's really interesting. Yeah. I mean, there's just tons of opportunity here. That's the bottom line, which I'm hearing over and over from you. So two last points that I want to cover with you. The first one being funding. We've had a lot of funding in recent years, of course, where we had the infrastructure investment jobs act, Um, And I know that's brought kind of a windfall, if you will, that's been distributed across the states. With all this funding and policy that's going on right now around the infrastructure in our country, how is that impacting specifically the energy sector or will impact the energy sector? Well, yeah, I think I I mentioned just before really kind of this um, once in a generation transformation that we're going through, transition that we're going through. and, And partly that's due to the sheer amount of funding that really has not been seen in this generation coming from the federal government relative to energy infrastructure, right? So whether that's EV infrastructure and or, you know, the the billions of dollars being pumped into zero emission vehicles and that, you know, the incentive programs around that, you look at $70 billion plus going into power infrastructure. So looking at transmission corridors, looking at, you know, where do we need to move electrons and how do we get through permitting process quicker? How do we get these lines built quicker? You know, you look at the aging infrastructure that we have from a transmission perspective and the need for that investment is key right now. Um, you look at what, you know, the the renewable tax credits are doing to allow and continue those projects to be profitable and move, you know, forward at the pace that they're doing. And then lastly, you know, billions of dollars being pumped into hydrogen to make it more economical because, We see that as a future fuel, especially green hydrogen and being cleaner, but it needs to get there economically, right? So obviously that funding and that ability to kind of help support that. So 
we're seeing, you know, for the energy space in particular, we're seeing this unprecedented, you know, amount of funding being pumped into it, which is fantastic. I think, you know, with any type of funding, right, it's the matter of let's get the money moving faster, right? You know, and ultimately, you know, how do we get these jobs, you know, created? How do we get these projects built quicker, faster? The fact that this funding is available and just kind of working through that to get the money released is something that I think as an industry, we'd like to see more. It is being released, right? But I think sure. there's a sheer volume there that we're all eager, you know, for it to really make an impact in the industry. Okay. Yeah. I mean, I guess it's like anything else. We got to stay on top of it to make sure that it keeps moving. And I guess in any way that we can help, right? We've yeah. got to try to help whether it's policy and getting engineers involved in policy and things of that nature, which I'm sure WSP does a lot of with all of the staff that you have. But, um, but that's a good thing for us to think about. All right. The last thing I want to ask you about, which I think is important, is kind of this idea of cross training, breaking down silos and firms. Because to me, the energy sector is one where you can really pull expertise from all the other sectors, right? Civil, electrical, mechanical, yeah. like we talked about. So I would imagine for someone in your position, when you're thinking about your staffing and building your team, you really have to be connected and in conversation with the different sectors in your organization because you could really get people from anywhere. Yeah. Yeah, no, I'm glad you asked the question. And and obviously, maybe a little bit unique, right? We're 70,000 people globally, sure. right? We truly do have expertise. Not everybody has that. But yes, for somebody like us and others you know, that are like us, we do have that luxury of pulling in resources from other business lines, um, whether it's a building, a highway, a bridge, a tunnel, right? Like I said, at the end of the day, and I've had the luxury of doing this in my career, Energy is needed in all of those instances, whether it's the lights on the bridge, whether it's, you know, transforming, trans, you know, transmitting power across that bridge, relocating transmission lines because of a highway, you know, energy is really touching all of these spaces and myself included, I've had the ability to work, you know, across business lines on those projects, bringing my electrical expertise. So electrical is electrical, mechanical is mechanical, civil, is civil, right? Um, you know, it doesn't matter if you're, you know, laying and siting for a building versus laying and siting for a, you know, substation, right? You know, the, the concepts, the background, the fun fundamentals, and the foundation of each of those disciplines is cross business line, right? And I think when you look at it through that discipline lens, we do have that and we benefit from that tremendously to leverage the skill sets, leverage those disciplines. And, and really the benefit that that provides to that individual is, it gives them that ability, like myself, to learn about something new, work with different people that you may have not worked with in the past, and really kind of expand your horizon and what your ability to deliver, you know, kind of across business line may look like as well, too. And I think, you know, kind of continuing down that theme of, you know, breaking down barriers and silos, you know, that, you know, ability to kind of utilize the disciplines is a key factor in that equation. Mm -hmm. But I think also from a leadership perspective now, you know, kind of taking it back up, you know, from a leadership perspective, it's very easy for silos to get built in any type of organization. And I'd be remiss to say, you know, don't kid yourself. It, it does take a lot of work to avoid that from happening. Right. And to make certain that you build those relationships, you build that trust so that that doesn't occur. And what we've come up with, you know, relative to how we like to, to think and act is, this intentional integrated thinking. And really what that means is, you know, we need to communicate and build buy-in across our organization. We need to educate them about what we're collectively doing across business lines and how we can cross sell and really put that through this integrated thinking model for our clients. Because first and foremost, it's all about our clients, right? So how can we differentiate ourselves in the market, in the lens of our clients, it's being that integrated full service provider to our clients. And I think it's something that we've seen great success. Um, and obviously all of that hard work, when you have that success is worth it, right? So I think sure. at the end of the day, putting your clients first, building that trust in the relationships that you've developed over the years in an organization really can make that successful and something that I think we're seeing here at WSP. That's great. And really, my big takeaway from my conversation with Mike today is, yes, there's a ton of opportunity in the energy sector, but the opportunity is available to really all 
engineering professionals. It's not yep. limited to just civil or electrical or mechanical or plumbing or anything. There's so many different opportunities that if you're in your career, regardless of what you've done to date, there may be an opportunity for you to work on projects in the energy sector or get more involved in the energy sector. And to me, that's exciting. I mean, I always tell people, you could be working on something tomorrow or the next day as an engineer that didn't exist yesterday. Yeah. Right. With AI, with technology, with energy, which is why I think getting involved in this industry is so exciting because you'll have so many different opportunities of different things to work on, which is great. So, no. so Mike, I want to thank you so much for spending some time with us today on the show. I think you really kind of enlightened a lot of engineers out there that aren't familiar with the energy sector about it. And it sounds like you're doing some awesome things at WSP. So I thank you for coming on here and sharing them with us today. No, thank you. I appreciate the opportunity. It's been fantastic. I hope you enjoyed my conversation with Michael. He is doing a lot of great things. He's become an amazing leader in our industry, which goes to show you that you as a technical professional can become a leader. And the energy sector has so many opportunities that may be available to you, opportunities that you're not even aware of yet. If you enjoyed this conversation, please subscribe to our channel here. We do put out videos like this on a weekly basis to help engineers become better managers and leaders. I'll see you next week.